Well, good evening and welcome back to our conversations with the beloved disciple. And let me begin with the obvious. You sure do dress nice. Look at you. Uh, as I look at you and look at me. No, we did text about wearing jeans, but we did not mention any color schemes or whatever. Yeah, and we walk in happens. and in the same color. So no, you look good. You're going to have to put up with this tonight. <laughs> uniforms. Well, hopefully, hopefully we'll be in agreement with our study tonight. Well, we're talking about unity. Well, that is true. That's, right. That's a great point. That's exactly what the Lord's going to say. I want all my disciples to be unified. That's right. All right. Now, he did say one with the Father. That's right. Uh, so uh, that's where we definitely want to be unified right. more than anything, not just a tire. But Mark, good to see you. Good seeing you. Good all being right. here. And good to see everybody joining us this again this evening. We've had great participation with these studies, and so thank you for that. Tonight, we are in John chapter 17. And if there ever was a prayer that is indeed the Lord's Prayer, this is it. And I, I would think, Mark, as we get into this, to just set the setting. Uh, Jesus prayed this prayer, and it wasn't just a prayer. He was praying to the Father. I really get the impression when you study this and look at it, this was one of those prayers that was also like almost a sermon in a way. Not that he was preaching to his disciples, but he prayed the prayer knowing they were listening and wanted them to listen. Yes, and it's in the third person. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to understand that. When he's talking about himself there, he's talking about himself in the third person. So I see this. He could have just been looking at them and talking to them, but he emphasized to them, I am saying this to the Father. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just that reiteration, just putting that much more importance to it, and he addresses the Father. He says to him certain things. And so we learn so much about prayer here, how to pray, what to pray, things to say in our prayers. Uh, because if the Lord does it, we certainly should mimic it and, sure. and say some of the things that he's saying here, at least in general. And um, I think it's a prayer to the apostles, um, but it's showing importance to these apostles for some of the work that they're going to be doing. Right. And so this is quite a prayer. I, I, I can imagine being in his presence and seeing him addressing the Father and just what it's doing to you personally. Well, and there's kind of a threefold audience, if I can throw this out there. You have the Lord, yes. who he's praying to. This is a prayer. So Jesus is praying to the Father. But he's also speaking to his disciples. Yes. They're a part of this prayer and certainly included in it. And then so are we. Yes. He, he's going to appeal to those who listen to the apostles. And the Lord appeals then, if you will, to us in that respect as those who listen to the beloved disciple and the others that we do the exact same thing that he's sharing with them. Yeah. He talks about himself first mm -hmm. in the first few verses. So the address is to the Father about him and their relationship. Then it's the apostles right. and his and the Lord's relationships. Then he goes on to say to the Lord, and I want to pray for those in the future that hear their yeah, words. Hear their words. They hear the words of the apostles. So again, to reiterate, what the apostles tell us is gospel. He's yes. saying to them, this is... You, they're going to be hearing your words, and they're our words because we are unified. We're one. You know, that brings up an interesting thought. Uh, it wasn't even in my notes that here Jesus has always spoke as one who has authority. Everybody always marveled at that. He, even the people on the outside, wow, he speaks as one with authority. And now Jesus is telling his disciples who are still trying to put all things together, your words are going to carry that authority. It goes back to what we saw in 14 and 16. Yes. The Holy Spirit's going to guide you, yeah. but it's going to be your words going forward yes. that are going to have the exact same authority and are going to reveal everything. Yeah, I am telling you those words through the Holy Spirit. God right. is telling you those things through the Holy Spirit, but they're going to be hearing your words. You're putting it down in print. You're sending letters to people. You're sending epistles. It's going to appear as if it's your words, but it's our words. It's my word. It's God's word because we are all unified. But it, 
look at the importance of calling it their words. So if I read something in Corinthians, I had better be taking it to heart. It's gospel. It's gospel. Mm -hmm. It's gospel. All right, let's get into this prayer. We remember our setting now. Uh, The Lord's with his disciples. They ate the Passover meal together, and now he is just simply taking them through the city. They haven't crossed over the book, the brook Kidron. We're going to see that when we get into the next chapter. So they're still on this side of the brook. They're not to this. They're not in to the garden of Gethsemane yet, because this is not the prayer in the garden. So this is probably a prayer that he prayed with his disciples, either near the city wall, just outside the city wall before they cross over the brook. And it's as if he's huddled everybody around him. They're all in nice and tight. And he prays and he begins his prayer. Notice his posture. He lifts his eyes up to heaven, kind of unusual, but he's taking the disciples to the father. And the first thing he does is he prays to the father on behalf of himself. Yes. The hour has now come. This is different language. Uh, If you remember back in John chapter two in the first miracle where he tells his mom, my hour has not yet come. Well, now the hour is there. Yes. And this is the hour for which he came to the earth. He has come now to bear the reproach of sin, to be the sacrifice, as John called him. Here comes the Lamb, the Lamb of God. And so he comes to the Father, and he's asking the Father now to glorify the Son. Now, I find this kind of interesting. That's just my thoughts. I'd love to hear yours. Jesus gave up the glory of heaven to come down to the earth. And now here he is turning to the father, asking that the father would glorify him again. And he has been living a life to give glory to God. Do you kind of get the impression Jesus is saying it's now all complete? And the last three years I've been giving as glorification to you to fulfill this great purpose. He says that in verse five. That's exactly. And now glorify thou me together with thyself, Father, with the glory which I ever had with thee before the world was. So I see him having given up that glory. And now the summation of glory is going to come in him dying on the cross for mankind and then being raised from the dead. The complete glory we're going to read in Scripture from then on is when he gets back to heaven and everything is given to him right. that he had had before. God answers that prayer. All of the, that comes in this glory. Yeah. He now is at the right hand of God and he is over everything. His glory is back. And, and you also kind of see, well, first of all, just real quick, glory just means to hold in high regard, yes. to esteem. Yes. Uh, it can be the idea to certainly praise. Uh, and so we see that. It's, it's also, though, to me, kind of interesting that Jesus became a man and he gave up glory, the glory of heaven. There's that humility there that, uh, if you will, a self-sacrifice of humbling oneself because the true glory that we should long for is the same glory Jesus was longing for. That is to be glorified by the Father. Yes. Glorifying the Father that he will glorify you in return and lift you in high regard. And and it's kind of neat when you think about it that Jesus is not just praying this prayer. He's telling his disciples, here's what I've done. Yes. Yes. Uh, you have the reminder there, like you said at the end of verse 5, I was with you before the world existed. That takes us back to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And so the, Jesus begins with himself. And then, and then in verse 6, he talks of what his mission was all about, of manifesting the name of the Lord uh, to the people of the world. And, and although he was not of the world, he came to the world. And we're going to see that even repeated for the disciples as he prays that they may be not of the world while they're in the world. And so we see that sanctification, don't we? Yes. And even up here in these first few verses, he, he's talking about giving him authority over all mankind. He right. had it at one time, and now it was taken away from him. He's now saying, 
give me that authority. And I have now been on this earth to do what? Reveal eternal life. Right. I have revealed eternal life because I am eternal life. And, and then in verse 3, and this eternal life, that they may know thee. Right. What a... That's where eternal life is. In, well, in the, the whole the point is, yeah. what is, what's that knowledge there? Is yeah. that just a, just a thought of God? Is that, oh, I believe that God exists? No, that yeah. knowing there is a relationship with God. That term is a similar term of, of man knowing woman, that, that, that husband-wife situation. That's the know there, and that's the kind of relationship we're supposed to have with God. That kind of knowledge, that, that intimate knowledge we have with God. And that's, he didn't use the term believe there. No. He says no. Well, in, in the Greek, that word no is gnosko, yeah. which suggests the idea of knowledge that comes through experience. Yes. Uh, it comes from being together, from yeah. relating yes. together, from being around one another. It's like, it's like sometimes you know how somebody's going to react to something just because you've seen them in this situation yes. so many times before. And, it's, and, and, that, and that's us today. When we get into a situation, we know what God would want us to do because we have that relationship right. with him. And so we know that. We know that we shouldn't do this. We know that we should do that. Why? Because we know God. And that's what he's saying here. I want people to understand that I was here on this earth to reveal that to people and that you could have eternal life. And it takes us back also, I guess, to his words. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, which he had said to Philip uh, and the others a little earlier in John 14. So there is that revelation, and I want them to see this and know this. And, 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 and if Jesus is looking to heaven and his disciples are gathered around, I want you yes. to know this yes. as well. I yes. want you to know this I need to as reaffirm well. that to you, and it, it did to John, Certainly. because what is his first chapter in 1 John talking about? We were with the the eternal life. Right. Yeah, that's, that's first John. That's the epistle. It. First John yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. That's how he describes it. Uh, and you find that repetition in, in many of the things that John writes in that epistle. Uh, the segue, though, from himself to the disciples yeah. is also very powerful. We mentioned it just a little bit there. Uh, it, it, he speaks to the disciples as being those who belong to the Father and, and Boy, don't that that certainly had to make them feel certainly confident at that time. But they are yours, and they're yours because I've given them your word, and they have kept yes. your word. Uh, and then he he goes on to say, and I've given them the words that you gave to me. Again, that subjection that you see even by Jesus. And so the emphasis, again, on that knowledge, but also that relationship. And so it, here's to me where it, it, it really gets profound when Jesus says, I'm praying for them, but not of the world. No. What's he mean? Well, in this particular prayer, he's saying, I have some special people here on earth that you gave me. God, you gave me these apostles. Now, there are... The Calvinists would love these passages about talking about giving that God has preordained or predetermined mm -hmm. some of these things about giving. All God has done here is I gave you the knowledge and the understanding of picking 12 men that were going to represent you and me on this earth. And I told you basically the ones to pick. Now it's interesting that God told him to pick the betrayer. Well, and he mentions that. Yeah, the only right. one lost that's is right. the son of destruction. That's right. You know, which but, was expected. But one that he yeah. did. Mm -hmm. But the ones that remained it was from the power of God. God had done that. And, and I'm a kind of amused that the Lord sort of offhandedly says in verse 8. And they truly understand that I came forth from thee. And they believe that thou didst send me. If... The apostles don't know a whole bunch of things. <laughs> but there's one thing that Jesus can confirm to the Father, that they understood 
that I did come from you. Right. Well, and, finally. And, and, finally. And, they, and they've said that more than once. Yes. We know you have the words of eternal That's life. Right. So they get they may not understand the whole kingship right. uh, yet, but they do understand but that. They point. understand and believe. Yeah. There may be some uh, of the world that God had to be involved in this, but they weren't believing it. Yeah. So understanding and they took it a step further. Not only did they understand, but they believed. Well, and they did so because they believed his words. Yes. And, and Jesus is going to show that great association that he has with them and the Father in verse 10. All mine are yours. Yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. And then in verse 11, he, he doesn't necessarily get ahead of himself, but he shows you where this is headed. Yes. I am no longer in the world. I, he's still in the world, yes. clearly, when he says that. But what he's referring to is the idea that the mission is now being fulfilled, but they've got to carry it forward. Yes. And they are in the world. I'm coming to you. And so, Lord, you please keep them in your name. In other words, by your authority. But they need to see this. We are all one together. And that's that unity yes. you were talking about. Yes. We began this. And... The fact that you gave me that name, keep them in thy name, the name which thou hast given me. So, I, 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 the authority is what he is talking about here. And you just go to Acts 4.12. Mm -hmm. And it's a very important uh, passage there in Acts 4.12, which says, There's no other name under heaven by which you can receive salvation, except yeah. the name of Jesus. Right. And so it's that authority that God has given to Jesus, and now they are to carry that name to the world. And so speaking of being in the world and going to the world, this is his prayer for them. He wants them, he wants them to have joy, but that joy is only going to come through sanctification. And so you'll find that he prays for their sanctification in truth. Well, we know sanctified means to be set apart. Yes. Uh, in the Old Testament, it would be a utensil or something that had been cleansed, set apart for the Lord's purpose. Uh, Jesus is praying, I think, as he speaks to his disciples, Lord, set them apart from the rest of the world. And may they see their need for sanctification for they're only going to find it in your truth. Sanctify them in this truth. And, and it's as if to some degree, he's kind of saying, I'm not going to be there to hold their hand anymore and, and walk them through this. Give them this. Let them be that. Let this be that guide to them. Is that how you see it? That's this? right. And what, what a small statement to have so much meaning. Mm -hmm. Thy word is truth. truth. Let that sink in. That thy word is truth. And so how are we sanctified today? Through the truth. Through the truth. Yeah. Through the word. And so this, this is also talking about us in the sense of how our sanctification is. Because he's just going to go on and say here now uh, that the words that they're going to proclaim are going to be for us. Sure. There's going to be people that they're going to convince uh, that I am your son. And that I have come to this earth and been glorified for you uh, through the cross. And I'm, they're going to convince people. And now I want them to be sanctified. So you kind of say there's three points that the Lord, I think, is making. And you may add to this. First of all, I want them to be of the world, in the world, but not of the world. Yes. They're, they're, they, they are different. They are different. They have a different calling, a different purpose. Secondly, we want them to be unified. Yes. And, and unified with one another as they're unified with us. And then thirdly, that they be sanctified uh, and sanctified by the truth. So they're in the truth. And really, that probably wasn't the best way to put that list. But those all three work together. And then in verse 20, it's the exact same desire he has for us. So if he's sitting there praying with his disciples and they're all around him and he's looking up, add yourself to that number. Put yourself right there listening to this prayer because verse 20 speaks to you and me. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, 
just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so the world may believe that you sent me. And isn't it interesting that he he impresses the idea of unity? Mm-hmm. He is, this, is, this is a completeness. This is a oneness. This is a singleness. This is not a union. This is not an agreement. This is not a league of people banding together yeah. for a common cause. No, this is unity. And he's going on to say here through this, that there is power in this oneness that people can see that, number one, I came from you. Number two, the importance of these apostles, just through the unity that all of these people represent. And how important is that for the world to see? Right. Our unity. And if we are not unified, if we're not acting as if we're in unity, we are destroying one of the elements that God wants on behalf of us to represent Him. Well, I think it's one of the greatest elements uh, yes. to represent Him. Uh, when you kind of look at it from just an evangelistic point of view, the, the disciples had to be unified in their message. Either, boy, they were just going to be persecuted and their yes. life was going to be challenging, but they had to be unified in their purpose, especially with respect to their message. And so you see that sanctification in truth. And He, and he prays that for us as well, that we be unified together. I, I don't think it means that you see everything exactly no. alike. I don't think it means that you don't have your disagreements every now and then. Uh, well, certainly Peter and Paul had theirs. Yes. Uh, and even the first century church, even before then, had some challenges. You see that in Acts 15 uh, in, in many ways. But they were always drawn back to the truth. But the message to 1 Corinthians was you be unified. Yes, yeah, you go to 1 Corinthians, right. certainly, yeah. yeah. Uh, in fact, that's our college study on Wednesday that's nights right. if you want to join yes. us here at the building for that. So, so we've seen how he's prayed for himself, he's prayed for his disciples, and he's prayed for us. The message is all the same, that the Lord may be glorified in us. But he says in verse 24 something very important, that he wants all of these people to be with him and have the glory that I have, that you have given to me. Yeah. So we're talking a little bit about heaven here. Oh, certainly. Certainly. And so in, in time, he wants us all to be with him. So <laughs> we, what a wonderful prayer. What a wonderful prayer that he has expressed to these apostles and to us. Yeah. Well, and to me, this is where it even gets more powerful is how he ends it. With love. Yes. And, 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 and keep in mind, I, I think this is something challenging for us sometimes. He knows what's going to happen. Yes. He, he's going to go and he's now, he's been longing to get to the garden to pray so that he can really just pray to the Father on his own. He's been longing for that time, but he needs to pray with his disciples here. And, and he knows that they're going to be running away from him. He knows the son of destruction's already gone out. He mentioned that even in the prayer and that betrayal is coming. And yet... Even in the midst of all that, I will continue to make it known. What am I making known? Your name, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Would they question that love of God for Christ here in about the next 24 hours? It would be a challenge. (laughs) Are they going to... Are they going to say, what did he mean? I'm going to guess that there may have been a period of time in there. This love, God had love for his son, and this has happened to him. This is how you express your love? This This is is how 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 the love happens on a cross? And it was only after his resurrection and him being back with them for 40 days, and then the revelation of the Holy Spirit to them and what he revealed to them, did they fully understand that love. And they saw love. Love is sacrifice. Love is sacrifice. Love is giving up of one. Because now sacrifice. he's going to tell them the same thing. You got to love your brother the same way that I've loved you. Yeah. Now there's a challenge. There's a huge challenge. And so he's, they, he's going to demonstrate that for sure. them. He died for me on the cross. They're not seeing that during the time that he's on that cross. They are blown away with that. We're going to see that in the next three chapters. That this happened to... To Christ, it was when he came back to them. 
that they finally realize it. And Thomas finally saying, my Lord, Lord and my, my God. Yeah, you see that transformation. And, and then it, but as we look forward, as we look forward and we go through these remaining chapters, we're always going to be going back to this yes. prayer, remembering what Jesus said. And I'm, I'm sure that those are things that echoed in their mind yes. as well with respect to those things making sense that I must step down so that the Father may be glorified. And the only true glory we all should be, any of us should be sinking is the glory from the Father. And the glory is that we can have eternal life with God because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Yeah. And that's the glorification we're after. Well, one thing we know for certain, we haven't given this chapter justice in just no. the 24 minutes that we've been talking here. So hopefully you'll take some time to read through it again. Maybe these words that we've shared can help just uh, give it more life to you. Uh, but this is a beautiful prayer to read and yes. to learn. Anything else you want to well, And to learn the, how prayer. to pray in here. Yeah. You address the Father. You ask. You make requests. You tell Him the things that He's done for you. And you thank Him for those things. All of those things are in this prayer. And, and for others. Yes. You're and, focused on others. And so yes, he, others. so He shows us the things that we need to be doing in our prayer. Yeah, so don't just get honed in on Matthew yeah. 6 no. or the other passages that are, we see and sometimes refer to as the Lord's Prayer or those model prayers. This is the prayer look, you need to go to. Look at this one. Look at this one, certainly, as well. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us. Speaking of spending time with us, uh, let's talk about Sundays here real quick. Uh, we appreciate everybody for all your wonderful, nice comments regarding the elders address. Yes. And so we, we really appreciate it. And uh, we had quite a few people with us Sunday in one way or another. Yes, we had our typical 45 at 830. At 830. And we're, let's encourage you here, brethren. We're filling up pretty much on that second hour. And we would love for you to come back. We're as safe as we possibly can possibly can be in that 830 hour uh, and, and there's plenty of room and so if you can come back make your time available and come to us with us on at 830 it's a great time to be together we had around 150 or so at the 10 o'clock and not quite as full as the week before but it, it's getting full yes when you get up in that uh, higher than 150 170. Uh, range And then we had 117 watching the live stream Sunday. So we appreciate that. And then others have been watching. All right. We are back. We had some camera problems there. Technical right at the difficulties. End. <laughs> at least it was right at the end, not yes. the beginning this okay. time. But we did not get a chance to just say goodbye. And we just want to say thank you to everybody who's participating and watching these videos with us. And Lord willing, if we're not seeing you on Sundays, we'll see you here real soon. God bless. Good night, brother.